Okay, welcome back to our teaching uh, of the ministry of the bride and what makes them different than their brethren. We're talking about the Beatitudes and, uh, and we're looking at them and uh, what they really are showing us, uh, the depth, a little more depth of what they're showing us. And that each one of these, they're not different categories of people as some teach, but they are rather the attributes of the bride of Christ. It shows that the bride of Christ by possessing these attributes is really very few in number in the church because very few are manifesting these attributes. Okay. Let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 8. It says, Blessed or happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Interesting, the word pure in this verse is uh, Strong's number 2513. It's the Greek word uh, kathros. Uh, in theirs, it literally means uh, it is a, uh, uh, it, its first meaning is clean, but in, it is a similitude in this verse. And as a similitude, it means this. It is like a vine cleansed by pruning and so fitted to bear fruit. So it's a similitude. And so it's saying, blessed are the pure. Who's the pure? A vine that has been pruned so that it bears fruit. I know in my heart, I have been pruned over and over and over again. <laughs> but each time I am pruned, I bear more fruit. And then something else comes, and I find myself pruned again. <laughs> it's all right. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes with that Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28 for your notes. Matthew 23, 25 through 28 for your notes. I'm going to turn to Psalms chapter 15 for a moment here. Psalms chapter 15. There we are. Starting at verse 1. It says, a psalm of David. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity. He who works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does he uh, uh, do evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. So he's saying, who is it that dwells in your tent? Who is it that is on this holy hill? It's the person with these attributes. He who walks with integrity, who works righteousness, who speaks truth in his heart. He does not take up evil against his neighbor. He's pure in heart. He's pure in heart. Do you want to dwell in the tent of the Lord? Do you want to be in his tabernacle? You know, it's interesting. The bride of Christ, it says, will, will be uh, in the temple of God. Actually, they are the pillars of the temple of God. They become the pillars of the temple of God. There's two pillars. There's Jachin and Boaz, the two pillars in the temple of God, showing two different aspects of their nature. Steadfastness in the house of God. That, is the, that, that represents the bride of Christ. The bride is the pillars in the temple of God that hold up the porch into the holy place. Praise God. Praise God. You want to go into the temple of God, you've got to pass by those two pillars. You've got to pass by the bride. The bride ministry in the last days, guess what? They're going to see Jesus. He's in the holy of holies. But they've got to pass by the two pillars first. They've got to go by Jacob and Boaz. They've got to go right up the altar, by the altar and through the porch. So they've got to go through the bride to go into the holy place and then further into the Holy of Holies. The bride is going to manifest Jesus. 
the bride is going to manifest the very temple of God. The bride is the very pillars to the temple of God. The church is going to sit there and say, who is your beloved more than ours? They're saying that because they're looking at her eyes and they're saying, through your eyes I see your beloved. That's why you're beautiful. So the beloved is inside the temple and past these pillars. What do you think they're going to send us out two by two? Jesus sent the apostles out two by two because there's two pillars on the porch of the temple of God. They go out two by two. It's a double witness. Jacob and Boaz. They stand there holding up the temple of God. When the bride goes out, they're going to be sent out two by two, taken, translated by the Spirit of God from place to place worldwide. Not to the world, but back to the house of Israel. Back to the house of the church. Not the literal Israel, but the spiritual Israel. God will deal with the literal Israel later. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go up to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Let me go there. Second Corinthians 7 verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We have all these promises. We have these promises of Christ himself manifesting through the temple, which you are. And more than the temple, you're the very pillars of the temple. We have these wonderful, magnificent promises. What should we do with them? We should make diligent our calling. We should make diligent our stand. We should make diligent every single day that we have. Because, brethren, you're going to find you have just enough time left. You have just enough time left. You don't have extra time. You have just enough time left. The days are wicked. Wickedness and plague is on the earth. We're in the last times. You have just enough time left to become transformed. What does that mean? Every day be diligent before the Lord to make sure his calling and his choosing of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says this. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Praise God. This is in the day of maturity. And that's what my heart longs for. To be known fully as I am known. To know, excuse me, fully as I am known. God knows me inside and out. I want to know him the same. I want to know fully as I am known. I want a personal relationship that is personal and a relationship every moment of every day. I don't want to have just my down payment. I'm hungry for all of it. And that doesn't mean gold and silver and streets of gold and, that, and all that foolishness. It doesn't mean a position of power. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I want to know the, the, the full darkness where he dwells. I want to know the full light that is alive. Because in the full darkness is peace beyond description. But in the full light is life and energy and renewal and hope. I want to know it all. Not that I can be a brainiac. I want to know it all by knowing it right here in my heart. I want to know even as I am known. Praise God. With that, Revelation chapter 22, verse 4 for your notes. Okay, back to Matthew chapter 5, now verse 9. <laughs> Blessed or happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Wow. Wow, sons of God. I thought sons of God were fallen angels. That's what people are teaching today. <laughs> I don't want to be a fallen angel. I want to be a saint. I don't want to be just a saint. I want to be the one. I want to be closest to his heart. Yes. Sons of God are not a reference to fallen angels as some teach. 
Sons of God is a reference to those who have a God-like nature, whose heart is to be like God. And I guarantee you, fallen angels do not. The Lord tells us in, in Genesis 3, he tells us that you have become like, a man has become like one of us, hasn't he? Speaking to Lucifer, who the fallen angels are like their father, Lucifer. Man did become like somebody, didn't become like God, did he? He became like Lucifer to know good and evil. He fell. The firstborn of that man became a murderer. The first murderer of the earth. I want to be a son of God. Because that means their moral character is to be like God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers. Strong's number 1518. Uh, <laughs> uh, go ahead and look it up. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. In Thayer's, though, it says a very interesting thing. It says, very specifically, one loving, actively, peace. One loving peace. It isn't just, oh, I'm, I'm a good uh, referee, I'll be a peacemaker. No, it's one that is loving peace. Loving peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed those who, who do not look for strife, who do not want strife, who are not uh, uh, looking to... Uh, a fight, but blessed are those who are loving peace. Though that's who the sons of God are, those who love peace, those who hate strife. With that, Revel or Romans, excuse me, chapter twelve, verse eighteen. Romans chapter fourteen, verse seventeen through nineteen. Book of Hebrews chapter twelve, verse fourteen, and James chapter three. We're going to turn there. Book of James chapter three. I'd like to read that, uh, beginning at verse 16. It says this, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I love that. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know what's amazing about this, and I'll end with this, but... When Jesus sent the 70 out, first the 12, then the 70 out, two by two, he said an interesting thing a lot of people don't understand. He said, if, they, if one receives you into their house and a man of peace be found there, let your peace reside. But if, one, if a man of peace is not found in that house, then take your peace with you and shake the dust off of your feet because better it'll be in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that house. They had a visitation of God. So it's interesting, if the fruit of righteousness, trying to be sown by the bride saints, is sown in peace, but there not be ground, fertile ground of peace found in that house, then that seed will return to the one who's sown it. How do we interpret that? What does that mean? Peace Brethren, what that means is this. It means reconciliation with God. The peace means full reconciliation with God because where that reconciliation is, then strife ends. There's no more struggle with sin or separation. So when the bride saints are sent out two by two and they come into a house, say this church, and they're standing there, and the Spirit of the Lord fills the house because it, it has filled them, so it also fills the house. The Spirit is looking in every single heart. Every single heart is the temple of the Lord. In the back of the temple is the garden that feeds the temple. If there isn't uh, 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 ground that has been plowed up, made uh, ready to receive the seed of peace, and the ground itself is not peaceable, the seed of peace will not reside there. And it will come back to you. 
But if there be one person of peace in the house, in other words, a bride saint within there, they will hear the message and accept it, and that seed of peace will spring up into a great and mighty tree instantly. But for all the rest, those two bride saints walk out the door, and they feel by the Spirit, the Spirit came back to them without having found a home in any, anybody in the church. And if that's the case, they will shake the dust from their feet because judgment will fall on that house next and they'll be left behind at the rapture. Isn't that amazing? What does it mean to be a man of peace? It means that the spirit of reconciliation dwells in you because that's what the peace is. The spirit of reconciliation to reconcile the church first, but then the world back into God. Why the church? Because the church has backslidden and grown sleepy and must be awakened and shaken sleep so that they can have that full seed of peace, of reconciliation in their heart. And if they have that, they can become part of the bride. But there are very few it'll happen to. And that spirit of peace or reconciliation will come right back to you. You'll feel it. Just like Jesus, when he was uh, in a crowd trying to get through, he suddenly felt somebody touch the hem of his garment, and he felt virtue or power, the healing power of God, go through him into somebody. So he turned around and said, who touched me? The apostles laughed and said, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. He goes, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me in faith. And the woman then you know, cried out, it was me. And the Lord, then, then the Spirit spoke to him and said, you know, tell her her sins are forgiven. Tell her she's healed. Tell her she's okay. She's not in trouble. And so the Lord did. Isn't that wonderful? By the same way, you will know when the Spirit of peace comes back to you, not having found a home. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. We will continue here next time in the ministry of the bride. Lord bless you.